Good evening. Glad to see all of you here this evening. Uh, we'll be using the books this evening, and if you don't mind, turn to number 111. 111. And we'll be doing the uh, first, second, and last verses. <clears throat> Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the crown and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. Number 866. 866. Sing this one through twice and then I'll, we'll have our opening prayer. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and bless me, the rock, and let the God of my salvation be Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this Lord's Day and the opportunity that we have to assemble ourselves together as your children to worship the only true and living God, the creator of the heavens and the universe and all that is in them. Father, we come at this time asking that you bless this nation, that you be with our leaders, that we will repent of the sins and iniquities that we have committed against you, that you will not 
execute your wrath upon us, but you will have mercy upon our nation and that we will repent of the sins that we do and we will be an example to you for the rest of the world. Also, we come at this time asking you to be with Keith and Trish as they labor and work in Greece with the church in Glafada and El Nico. We pray, Father, that they will build those relationships with other people that they work with over there and that they will be able to teach others about you and that others will believe and have faith and that they will result in an obedience. Also, we ask that you be with the people in Ukraine and other places in the world where they are being persecuted. We pray that the war will soon be over with there. We ask that you protect everyone and especially the members of the church that no one will be harmed or killed and it, it, that it will soon be over so that they can go back to the way they once lived. Also, we come at this time praying that you will help us to focus our hearts and our minds upon what Brother Eddie has to say to us, that we will apply them to our everyday walks of life, that we will be able to overcome the temptations that Satan puts before us, that we'll be able to teach others the knowledge that we have and we ask also that we can leave this building being strengthened and being an example for your son, Jesus Christ. For this we pray in his name. Amen. Yeah, if you'd like to mark it in your songbooks, our song of invitation will be number 29. Number 29. That'll be our song of invitation uh, when the time comes. Uh, but before our lesson, let's turn to number 598. 598. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses. If it's convenient, please stand for this song. 598. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing to see you tonight. Glad that you're here. It's nice um, to be able to have, of us all, have all of us here in the same room. I 
Uh, most of the year we're doing Discovery Bible Studies and uh, Children's Bible Hour, and those are all really good things, and I'm glad we do them, but it's also nice in the summertime uh, when we can all uh, come in here together, and so I'm happy to, to see that that's the case tonight. So I want to know, how would you feel? It was your project. It was your baby. I mean, you worked hard, you did it, you started it, you suffered for it, you put your blood, sweat, and tears into it, you worked hard to keep it going, you know, those crucial moments early on when it could have fallen apart, when it could have died, you kept it going just by your sheer determination, and you did well with it. It was successful. It got popular. Everybody was doing it. And it was your thing. It was your idea. You were the one that, that started doing it. You were becoming famous for it. But then, some Johnny-come-lately comes along and swoops in and takes over the whole thing. And now everybody's forgotten about you and they're all focusing on him and talking about him and everything's about him. Have you ever felt that way? If you have, it is a perfectly human way to feel. And if you have, then you know what John's disciples were feeling on his behalf as we look at our text tonight. The question is, should they have been feeling this way? I want you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. John chapter 3 verses 26 through 30. Now, this is early on in Jesus' ministry. He's, he's just getting started. He's been to Jerusalem in, in John chapter 2, but now he's out in the wilderness of Judea. And, and John is different from Matthew and Mark because John tells us, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because John tells us some things that Jesus did that the other Gospels don't cover. And one of the things that, they tell, that John tells us that Jesus did is that he started baptizing. In fact, Right before our text, you can read about this in John chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Now, it wasn't Jesus himself who was doing the baptism. John chapter 4, verse 2 explains that it was Jesus' disciples on his behalf. And this was not Christian baptism that, that Jesus was involved in, because Christian baptism is, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, into the death of Christ. And this could not have been into the death of Christ, because the death of Christ hadn't happened yet. So this was probably some extension of John's baptism. And Jesus and his disciples were having some success doing it. But as we also see in our text, at this time, John is still around. John the baptizer. And he's still baptizing. And he has some loyal followers who become jealous on his behalf. Which brings us now to the text, if you'll read it with me. John chapter 3, starting with verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So tonight we're going to spend a few minutes and we're going to study this passage, John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. And we're going to focus on how John handled Jesus' success. And we're going to do that by asking three questions tonight. The first question that we're going to ask as we uh, come, try to come to a better understanding of John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30, is what was the difference between John and his disciples? They are behaving in, in different ways. What was the difference and why was there a difference? So let's, let's think about this for a minute. What was the difference between John and his disciples? Well, clearly, John's disciples are jealous of Jesus on John's behalf. 
Now, all this started back up there in verse 25 with an argument. And it is an argument either with some Jews or with a particular Jew. There's a translation issue there. We're not going to get into that. But verse 25 tells us what they were arguing about. Or at least as much as we're ever going to know. They're arguing about baptism and purification. Now the Jews had all kinds of of purification rituals that they would go through to purify things, to to purify people even. And so it may be that they were discussing the difference between baptism and purifying a priest, for example, under the old law. There's a lot of unknowns here. We don't know exactly what this argument was about, but what is clear is that the argument got these disciples of John focused on the success that Jesus was having with his disciples baptizing. And so they come to John with an attitude of like, who does this Jesus guy think he is? Who does he think he is? Because John had been at the height of his popularity. Everybody was coming to hear John. Everybody was coming to be baptized by John. And now, verse 26, they're all going to Jesus. They're not coming to John anymore. And not only that, but but John's the whole reason that Jesus has gotten his start in the first place, right? Because Jesus had, had been with John. He'd been baptized by John. John had testified to him. John gave Jesus his start, at least in the mind of these disciples, right? If you put yourself in their shoes, and now, now he's stealing John's thing, baptism, and he's stealing John's crowds. Now, John's disciples were very loyal to him. And and we need to understand and acknowledge that, that that's actually, on the surface, a good thing. Loyalty is an admirable quality, right? As a matter of fact, Loyalty is a, is a really good thing, and we need more loyalty in our world today. People just aren't loyal anymore, right? When things start to look or go bad, people will desert you. So loyalty is a good thing. But loyalty can often lead to jealousy. It can lead to, to jealousy in all sorts of different, different situations when we get jealous on behalf of the one that we're loyal to. For example, a husband or a wife can get jealous on behalf of his husband or wife, depending on which one you're talking about, right? Like, if you rejected my wife for no good reason in favor of somebody else, well, I'd have a problem with that. And she would have a problem if you did the same thing to me. And it's the same way for parents with their children or for close friends. Or, and you see this all the time if you follow sports, right? If your sports team or your favorite player gets overlooked in a poll or in the selection of some award or something like that, all the fans get jealous on that team or that player's behalf because of their loyalty to that team or to that player. So loyalty can definitely lead to jealousy, and that's exactly what happens here. And that's normal, natural. What the disciples are doing here is a very human way to feel, a very human way to behave. But notice that John does not react in the same way. John's reaction here is anything but normal. John's talking about how he's not upset, he's not jealous. In fact, he doesn't seem to mind at all that Jesus is taking his thing and that Jesus is taking his followers. As a matter of fact, John gives every indication that he's happy about this. He says, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John, that's not natural. Why does he feel this way? Why is he okay with with Jesus stealing his thing and stealing his crowds? Well, that leads us to the second question that we want to ask tonight as we look at John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. We've already asked, what was the difference between John and his disciples? John was happy that Jesus was doing this. His disciples were jealous on John's behalf. Well, now let's think about what made John feel this way. Let's think about what caused John to have this this completely unnatural and unusual attitude about what's going on here. For high school and college graduates, they do something called who's who. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you were were in it. It doesn't really mean much to you once you get out of high school or college, right? But, But it's a kind of a nice honor to receive. 
That's where they select, you know, uh, superlative students and do profiles of them so that others can, can get to know them. The idea is to let you know, you know, who's who, who's worth paying attention to down the road. John felt this way about Jesus because John knew who was who. Between Jesus and himself, John knew who was worth paying attention to down the road. You see, Jesus was the Christ. He's the one the Jews had been looking for, longing for. The one who had been predicted all through the Old Testament. You go back uh, to, to Genesis. Uh, you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and you've got the Proto-Evangelion. You go back to Genesis 49, verse 10, it talks about Shiloh coming. You go to David, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 6, there's going to be a son of David whose throne is going to be established forever. You've got Psalms like Psalm 2 or, or Psalm 110 or so many others that are predicting the coming of the Messiah. You've got Isaiah with the servant songs. All through the Old Testament, you've got Old Testament prophecies again and again and again. The Jews read these, they studied these, they understood these, and they were looking for somebody to come. When John comes on the scene and he's wearing his camel hair and he's eating strange food and he's preaching with zeal and with fire, they thought, maybe he's the guy. Maybe he's the Messiah. Now John shut that thinking down right away. Go back to John chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. You see when this happened in real time. John writes for us, now this is the testimony of John, John the baptizer. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed and said, I am not the Christ. As a matter of fact, in our text, in verse 28, he reminded his disciples that he had said this, I am not the Christ. He also reminds them of his testimony to Jesus and pointing out who Jesus was. You skip a little later there in John chapter 1. And, and you look at verse 29. And when John sees Jesus coming, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then again in verse 34, John says, I have seen and testified that this, speaking of Jesus, this is the Son of God. So the point is, John knew who Jesus was, and he also knew who he was. John himself was the forerunner. The one who pointed the way to Jesus. Again, back in John chapter 1, verse 23 this time, John says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And in verses 26 and 27, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you who you do not know. It is he coming after me who is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. John understood his role. John understood that he was the one who came before the Messiah to ready the path, to prepare the way. That his job was not to be the Messiah, but to make a clearer path for him. So John knew that these were God-given roles. In fact, if you go back to our text and you look at verse 27, John says a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. These were God-given roles, and he knew what that meant. He knew that as, his, as a forerunner, his job was to point to Jesus, to point him out, to make his path clear, to, to make him known. And he knew that the Messiah, Jesus, deserved all the glory, all the honor, all the attention. Which is why he says in verse 30, He must increase, and I must decrease. And not only that, but he also uses the example of the bridegroom and his friend to make this even clearer. Now, in wedding ceremonies like we have today, you see something kind of like this, right? You have a big wedding party, and, and you have a best man. I'm, I don't know these people. It's a picture I found. But I'm guessing that the guy standing there next to the groom is, in fact, the best man. Well, back then, they had somebody kind of like a best man, too, who was the friend of the bridegroom. And the friend of the bridegroom had an incredibly important role in their weddings because mothers of the bride, see what you think about this, it was the friend of the bridegroom who took care of all the details of the wedding. Okay? He planned the whole thing. And he was also responsible for presenting the bride to the groom. 
But once he did that, he stepped back out of the picture and left things to the bride and to the bridegroom. That was John's role. He stepped back out of the picture when it was over. He had an important role, but he was not the focus. It's kind of like Ed McMahon, right? Ed McMahon is most famous for being Johnny Carson's sidekick on The Tonight Show, right? Now, he was famous in his own right, and he did other things. And I'm not meaning to sell Ed McMahon short tonight, but his main job over the years, you know, was to say, here's Johnny. And then he got out of the way. He knew his role, and he did well with it. John knew his role, and he was happy to fulfill it. Which leads us now to the last question that we want to ask tonight. As we think about John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30, we've already looked at the difference between John and his disciples. His disciples had a, a perfectly natural, normal reaction to what was going on here. They were jealous on behalf of the one to whom they were loyal. John, on the other hand, has a completely unnatural reaction to this. He's happy that Jesus is taking his spotlight. Then we talk about what made John feel this way. Because he knew who was who. Because he knew his role and he knew Christ's role. He's the forerunner. Christ is the Messiah. Now, the important question. What can we learn from John's attitude? What can we learn from John's attitude? And I think it's pretty obvious, right? There are going to be some times and some situations in life where we are not the important one. It's just going to happen. And sometimes it's not going to be fair. Sometimes in life, we're going to do all the work and somebody else is going to take the credit for it. Sometimes in life, we're going to be ignored and other people are going to get all the attention. Sometimes in life, we're going to do everything right and lose and somebody else is going to do everything wrong and win. Sometimes in life, Someone's going to steal our idea. Sometimes in life we're going to be in the backup role, behind the scenes, and somebody else is going to be in the spotlight. And not only that, but sometimes that's how the church works too. That's how the church works. Sometimes we're going to be involved or even heading up a ministry or a project and we're going to work really, really hard. And then somebody else at the last minute is going to take over and they're going to get all the credit and all the glory. Or sometimes we're going to feel like we have the ability to excel in a particular role. And somebody else who, in our opinion, is less able is going to get that role. Or sometimes somebody else is going to take credit for what we did and our hard work. It's really sad that sometimes we see Christians sulking over something good that happened because they didn't get the credit. It's sad, but it happens. And it's not always fair. Paul said in Romans 13 and verse 7, to render therefore to all their due, right? Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, Paul there is talking about our role as secular government, right? But the principle is the same. We're supposed to give credit where credit is due. We're supposed to be fair to people. But it doesn't always happen. And so when we are unfairly shoved out of the spotlight, or when somebody unfairly takes over what we started, it's easy to feel like John's disciples did. It's easy to have the, the natural human reaction that says, that's not fair, that's not right, I'm mad about this. Instead, we need to imitate John. And we need to rejoice at the good that's accomplished and the role, however small, that we had in it and the fact that we were able to be a part of it. Now, how do we do that? Well, to do that, we've got to have a mindset that focuses on Christ and not ourselves, which is the mindset we're supposed to have in the first place. But that means that we need to understand two things, particularly when we think about that in context of what we're talking about tonight. It means, first of all, like John, we need to understand our role. John knew his role. John knew, my job is to be the forerunner. 
Did you know that as Christians, as members of the Lord's church, that we actually have a more important role than John did? That's not my idea. Jesus said, Matthew 11 and verse 11, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. We've got an important role to fill in the grand scheme of things, but our role is more anonymous. You see, we're a part of a very large team in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, Paul says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are all also one body, so also is Christ. In other words, we're like one little tiny body part in a great big body. We're anonymous, but we're important. We're kind of like, some of us may be kind of like walk-ons, but that's okay. You know, everybody that's on the team is important, regardless of whether they get the credit or the attention. I, I, I'm a fan of college sports, you know that. And If you've got a team in, in college that's a championship team, it'll have stars and it'll have walk-ons. And everybody knows the names of the stars, and they get all the attention, and everybody's always talking about them. But the walk-ons are an important part of the team. And guess what? If the team's a championship team, they all get rings too. Because they have an important role to fill in the church. Whether we're the star or the walk-on, we all get a crown of life. Because we're all important to the Lord. So we've got to understand our role and... We've got to understand that what we must do is honor Christ in all that we do. It's not about our being honored. That's not our worry. That's God's job. Jesus told a parable. Flip over to Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 7 through 11. You're, you're familiar with this parable. It actually sound, comes off sounding like just good advice, but there's an important lesson behind it. So he told a parable to those who were in, to invited. Jesus is having dinner at someone's house here. So he tells a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you, you and him come to you and say, Give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when the one who invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, that sounds like just wise advice for when you're invited to a, you know, a, a banquet or something like that. But what really is going on there is Jesus is teaching about humility and how it's God's job to lift us up, not our job to lift up ourselves. Or as James says in James 4, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So it's not about our being honored. God's the one who will worry about that. It's about our being a part of the team that honors Christ. So I got a question. Why do we have fire ants? I'm serious. Everybody hates them. You know, I, I, now I, I believe that God created everything with a purpose, right? God created everything with a purpose, and, and so he created fire ants with a purpose. I just don't know what that purpose is, right? I mean, there's got to be some reason that these things exist on the earth. And thinking about it, I might have a suggestion. Maybe fire ants teach us something. Because if you step on a fire ant hill, you learn really quick not to do that. No, no. If you step on a fire ant hill, they will attack you with everything they've got. And they're not concerned about themselves. And they're not concerned about credit or attention or even getting killed. Their focus is on their one job, which is to protect the hill and protect the queen. That's all they care about. You know, we don't need to be concerned about ourselves, about credit, about attention. We need to be concerned about doing our part for the team and our part for Christ, about honoring Him. 
And so if we can learn that from the fire ants, then maybe they have a purpose. So we understand these two things, and we're able to rejoice then in the good that happens and not worry about who gets the credit or who gets the glory and, and who man is honoring or glorifying. We're able to bring glory to God. So what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about humility, right? Nobody likes to be overlooked or diminished. But that doesn't need to be our focus. Our focus needs to be on giving God and Christ the glory. We look tonight at John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30, about what the difference was between John and his disciples. John's disciples acted in a perfectly natural, normal way. They got jealous on John's behalf, but John is different. John is rejoicing at Jesus' success. We talk about what made John feel this way. Well, it was, it was the fact that he understood who, was, who understood who was who. He knew that he was the forerunner and Jesus was the Messiah. And then we talk about what we can learn from John's attitude. There are going to be times in life when we, unfairly even, are diminished and others are exalted. But we can rejoice in the good that is done if we have the mindset that John had. If we understand our role, we're a member of a great big team and we're all on the same side. And if we can understand that our job, no matter what else, is to honor Christ. Perhaps there's someone here tonight who's ready to respond to the invitation. I'm going to sing a song in just a moment to give you a chance, if you wish, to come down the aisle and to ask for help or prayers or even to obey the gospel if you've not done so. If there's anyone here tonight who wishes to come, we hope you'll come as together we stand and sing.